dub. I hope you guys can hear me. Well, okay. So uh, my name is Ankur Tere Desai. I'm a professor at the University of Washington Tacoma campus, manage the Center for Data Science. And today uh, I'm going to talk about our work on dynamic hierarchical classification for uh, risk of readmission. Uh, 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 one of our students who also did the work, graduate student Stacy Newman, is in the audience, so acknowledging that. Um, before I launch into the whole readmission process and the problem, I want to highlight that uh, the talk that I'm giving is specifically tuned towards the industry government track talk. So you may not see as much detail of the math that I would have normally put as a professor, uh, but I have put a lot of engineering uh, in the talk so that people can appreciate and understand how much effort has gone into building uh, this technology and getting it deployed. So let's start four years ago. Obama is elected, well, eight years ago. Obama is elected, Affordable Care Act comes in, and uh, there is a claim that you know, 76% of all readmissions are considered avoidable. In fact, the claim is that these readmissions are costing us $17 billion annually as taxpayers. Uh, and one in three patients gets readmitted to the hospital within a month if they are facing a chronic condition. The problem was considered extremely severe. Uh, if you go hospital by hospital by hospital across the United States, you will notice that uh, the numbers are worse than that in many, many, many hospitals. Uh, the highlights of our work that I'm going to talk about today is we have designed a framework. So this is not a single machine learning model. It's a framework for automatically developing a hierarchy of readmission models that can be deployed quickly. Uh, it does feature selection and feature anal factor analysis uh, on its own. The, the concept is... Uh, is, is very nice. Uh, it can be augmented by a lot of work that uh, you know people like Rich have done uh, in this in this framework. Uh, and and I want to acknowledge the amount of work someone like Rich has done over the last five years in this field as well. Uh, various classification algorithms are automatically designed using different layers, and we can tune or optimize for a variety of AUCs uh, or AUC precision recall and quality metrics. And we've done rigorous uh, empirical evaluations uh, and deployment is the biggest one. So when normal people think about uh, a patient, we always think about a linear flow. A patient gets admitted to the hospital. Uh, doctors in the hospital are working hard on this patient, trying to solve the problem. Uh, they get admitted to emergency. From emergency, they move to an inpatient setting. Uh, after they are inpatient, a bunch of treatments and procedures get done, and then the patient goes into what we call as ambulatory or post-acute care, and then they, they are supposed to go home. Unfortunately, uh, and there are many tools that do these predictive modeling at various parts of the patient life cycle. Unfortunately, this view of healthcare is entirely wrong. Uh, the view of healthcare is something like this. It is a cycle of chronic care where patients get admitted uh, they, they face some difficulty in the care, and then that care is never complete, so they keep coming back. And not just can you treat the problem of uh, chronic care management as only readmission, the problems of readmission, mortality, and quality of care are all highly correlated in that context. So you have to have solutions that not only target one objective function, such as readmission, you also need solutions that target other objective functions which are highly correlated to the problem of readmissions. This was all uh, what was going on in our mind when we were designing this dynamic hierarchy classification framework. Today's talk is going to end the paper, specifically focuses only on the CHF 30-day risk of readmission, but I'm, I'm providing you the context of why it is important. So when we began this work about three and a half years ago, uh, we said, okay, you know, this patient, so we were approached by multiple provider partners. Uh, here is a patient. Patient is Dorothy. Dorothy is ready for discharge. Uh, and can you predict if Dorothy is likely to come back to the hospital? And we said, okay, so, you know, we all uh, attended Ronnie Kohavi's talk about setting right objective functions yesterday. And, and we said, well, let's set some right objective functions. So what is the objective function? Is it... Uh, 
predict a risk score for Dorothy or is it predict a probability uh, of a risk score uh, given a threshold and then you binarize it, right? So you can set up this problem in multiple different ways. What we tried to do was we said, okay, let's attack it from a simple data science perspective. Uh, you, have a, you have a bunch of historical data of patients, you extract the features, and then you, you build a machine learning. You throw a bunch of machine learning algorithms at it, and you build the model, right? And then when you know you got class labels uh, and so on, then you get a predictive model out of it. And when a new patient comes in, we will simply extract features, score the patient, and we are done. Unfortunately, healthcare does not work like that. Healthcare is closer to, uh, I'll leave it up to your imagination to imagine which part of the picture represents healthcare. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's what we learned. We learned that you know, there are many, many, many different uh, optimization criteria to move the healthcare animal uh, uh, forward, right? The problem is even more severe because healthcare itself is so siloed with multiple data sets, multiple factors. And today, in the healthcare industry, there are enormous number of tools that attack each of these separately. So if you take lay score, they will tell you that they do best state of the art, you know, CHF risk, risk of readmission prediction using vitals and comorbidities. That's it, right? And then you take something else and they will tell you, oh, I only work on lab tests and other things. What we really wanted to build was an infrastructure, a framework that takes into account all of these things, claims, clinical, vitals, sociodemographic factors, nurses' notes, unstructured text, all of it. How can you get 100% uh, patient 360 overview of a patient in the life cycle, including variables, and do the predictive modeling? And then you would wonder, as a data scientist or as a machine learning person, uh, what will make the physician happy? I think in the previous session, uh, a couple of people asked that question. So what does it take to get a model deployed? And what you learn is this is what makes the physician happy. Okay? Most of the hospital-centric tools today are very simple Excel-type spreadsheets where a care manager, uh, a nurse practitioner is very happy predicting the risk of readmission of a patient as long as the patient scores above a 6 on a 0 to 10 scale. Okay? They're happy with this solution. It's our job as data mining community, as machine learning scientists, to have a bake-off with such risk tools. And each of us is going to have to fight this battle with a different version of this tool for the next five years. That is the struggle that we as, as machine learning, data scientists, people were trying to face uh, at hospitals. Now, is that the end of it? Have I, have I painted a story that is so bad that there is no solution? Of course not, yes. Don't most of these risk tools have very high false positives? Yes. So, so again, just like we are all falling into the trap of uh, you know, reading papers, accepting papers based on AUC scores, uh, the tool designers have fallen into that trap as well. In fact, it is so bad that 80% of the tools won't even do out-of-sample scoring. And I'm not kidding. You know, they, they don't do k-fold cross-validation. They will just take 10, 10 samples from the same patient set, give it to you as a case study, and they will say, look, I, saved, I can you know, save 8 out of these 10 patients on which I had originally trained the model. It's that bad. So what we started to do, what we started to rethink the problem in a very different way. We wanted to be cloud friendly. We wanted to be able to design and deploy classifiers very quickly as the underlying conditions change. And we wanted to make sure that the clinician is extremely happy when these classifiers go into action deployment. Okay? So we, we said, OK, let's come up with, uh, uh, now I'll go into the, the algorithm and the math of it. We said, let's, let's, let's treat this problem as a hierarchical classification problem. There are different care management teams that look at patients in a hospital setting at different points of time. So when the patient is admitted, probably all the patients that get admitted in the ER, you need a different classifier at this level. Then. Once the patient is about to get discharged, 
you need a different set of classifiers. So quickly you can imagine in your mind that a hierarchy of uh, hierarchy of ensembles of classifiers is needed in order to really solve the problem. The DHC core design idea is exactly that. All patients, the ones that are highly likely to get readmitted, go through a different set of classifiers, and then there are many internal stages to that classification process, and then eventually you have one single classifier that predicts the likelihood whether this patient will get readmitted within 30 days or not. Okay. For example, uh, if you only consider n is equal to 0, that is no internal layers, at discharge, so if, if you were to deploy this whole framework only for discharge, uh, at the point of discharge, uh, you would say, I have all my patients in the hospital who are inpatients, and now I am trying to first predict which of them will get this, uh, readmitted, so I got my probability threshold, and then I will use a very specific uh, machine learning model for predicting the readmission rate within 30 days for all those patients getting discharged. And then uh, you can increase n is equal to 1, and you can you know, say readmission within 90 days. Another very interesting uh, learning experience for me, um, I was telling some of the folks in the room, uh, for the last three and a half years, we have literally been going to hospitals you know, three times a week, two times a week, 7 o'clock in the morning, we are there trying to really figure out how to make sure that the machine learning AUC curves that we are showing to these you know, physicians actually make sense. Uh, what we learned was objective functions for care providers keep on changing every day. Okay? Today, they want a readmission model for 30 days. In another 10 days, they want a readmission model for 45 days. In another 15 days, they want to change the objective function to tell me, for that set of patients, can you give me a model for 90 days? Because as they start seeing improvements in their interventions happening for the 30-day readmission model, they want to improve their own mortality rates. Physicians are extremely motivated by, uh, by they're very competitive. They always want to beat each other's readmission rates. They want to beat each other's mortality scores, not as in make more patients die, as in saving patients, uh, just making sure. Uh, so you know, in, that, in that competitive uh, atmosphere, they expect the data science team to be able to deliver these changes in object, objective functions very fast. So uh, here, is the, here is the core idea behind how to enable that change in objective functions quickly. Uh, you essentially take a predictive model for all the patients, uh, and then you decide. Uh, so if it was 30, 60, 90, then time, uh, time is your, uh, is your uh, objective uh, function variable on which you are trying to optimize. You could easily replace time by something else. For example, it could be cost. Um, high, low, medium, it could be length of stay, uh, 5 days, 10 days, 20 days, and so on. So the hierarchy, the, the, the framework works for uh, all sorts of objective functions. Uh, and how do you decide which internal layer it should be? So it's a, it's a very simple algorithm. It essentially, uh, for the case of readmission, you look at your patient population and you say, oh, you know, the, the upper bound for readmission was 100 days. So you set x to be 100, and your lowest layer is going to be for predicting for 30 days. So you decide or k randomly between 100 and 30, and then you, you, you split the population for a random k between 100 and, say, 45, and then 45 and 30, and then find the centroids of those populations. And if you see if the KL divergence between these two uh, centroids or these two clusters is, uh, is you know, changing. So that's how you initialize. And then you repeat for various values of k till you find the best cut point where you, you feel that your classifier will have the highest separability. Uh, and, and then you essentially, uh, you know, when a new patient comes in, uh, you score them through all the layers. And uh, you deploy the model uh, at that point of care. But now what I want to talk about uh, is there is a, from, from being a machine learning scientist to being a serious you know, physician, there is a big bridge that we had to cross. And I want to show you what we have done. Uh, we have uh, taken the entire framework and architecture, deployed it on Microsoft Azure. Uh, we, we have deployed it on-prem using Zementis' Adapa scoring engine. Uh, we built several models using Azure ML. 
and then we also did risk scoring clinic at the at, at actual sites at multi care uh, we have integrated with uh, uh, analytics and reporting tools such as clickview so all that work also forms part of learning as a data scientist how you can take this technology and make it useful uh, here is the overall architecture it's fairly complex but i i can go over it with each of you uh, essentially imagine an external layer where data is coming from emrs uh, we built all the components to translate uh, clinical records from HL7 into uh, our Apache and then transform it and then so on. Uh, these are some of the screenshots of our deployment. Uh, so the score actually gets connected. Uh, you can see that there's a UWT risk score and then that risk score, uh, you know, I've blown that up here. So the, the, when the clinician visits and looks at the score, they can see it, they can sort patients by it. And in fact, now we are integrating with EMRs where the score will be front and center in the cardiac workflow for the patients uh, right, right now. Uh, here are some data sets. Uh, I will leave the results due to lack of time, but they are all in the paper, happy to discuss. Um, and here are some of our ongoing deployments uh, at UW Medicine. Uh, Madigan is a large active duty uh, army provider for, for care and multi-care, of course. Uh, here are some validation studies. Uh, we were pretty accurate. Uh, out of you know 360 patients that readmitted for 30-day uh, readmission in medium category, we were accurately able to predict you know 675 of them, and that's that's the proof in the pudding. Once you show these kind of tables or confusion matrices to any clinician, there is nothing they can do but accept that your model is better. Uh, last but not the least, it has been a wonderful journey with lots of graduate students and collaborators. I want to thank all of them. Uh, and acknowledge the support of uh, some of my uh, sponsors and funding uh, agencies. Uh, if there is one takeaway that I would like all of you to take from this talk is healthcare is not going to be easy. Uh, if any of young students here wish to stay in healthcare, I would advise them to quickly find other domains <laughs> unless, unless you are really prepared for transformative change because uh, we are thinking of the patient uh, and we are thinking of patient-centric care approaches, uh, then if, if we are really serious about it, we have to think about all the touch points where machine learning can really impact the care of a patient, not just within the hospital or the EMR. With that, thank you, and I'll take questions. Okay, questions? Uh, thank you for the great talk. So if we get a good score, predictive score, about the readmission, mm -hmm. so basically how the hospital can use that score to reduce the readmission rate? And is it, I think there is some decision support there. Right. And there are two questions. One is how they can use that score itself. And another is in terms of decision support, is there something that analytics can help? Yeah. So if I understand the question correctly, uh, just I'll repeat it. And, uh, how can the hospital, if you build a risk of readmission model and your risk of readmission model is very good, how can a hospital use that model, correct? And, and what, is the, uh, what is the process in which you can convince a hospital to use that model, correct? Very good question. Um, just like you, I ask this question, I've been asking that question for the last three years. Uh, the answer is really in um, making sure that you are very, uh, you, you present your statistics to the clinician team and make sure that the features that you are using for your readmission model are something that they think are actionable. So if you use features, such as you know a lab test result, which there's they, nothing they can do about that, then they are not very amenable to using. But if you use features that are actionable, for example, uh, you know if you rec if you can recommend interventions, uh, such as reducing sodium level will decrease the risk score by five basis point, then they are very open to that discussion, and then they will use a, use your model. Uh, does your work also help come up with, let's say, if the risk of readmission is high, 
Uh, does your work also help come up with a personalized health plan okay. so that you can actually, during this period, reduce the risk of readmission? Thank you, Manish. That, that's a very good question. And uh, we have another paper in ICDM last year that talks about personalized care management uh, plans. So what we did was uh, we uh, looked at millions of claims data sets. And from the claim and clinical integration, uh, we are able to uh, look at a pre-discharge plan for a patient and then reorder the discharge planning guidelines so that uh, you know, each of the factors that can be done at discharge uh, are prescriptive rather than just predictive. Uh, given the time, let's take the question offline. I'm sure Anko will be available. Yeah, thank you very much, Lou. Yes, thank yeah. you. Let's thank Sikhan.